All right, well, the topic on the table for tonight is really the, the pivotal moment, perhaps, in this whole discussion we've been having over the past uh, several months. This whole issue of the fundamental modernist controversy that's going on. If you could pick one event as sort of the hinge pin on which things turn, you know, the one seminal, the one event that you can point to that uh, is probably most significant, it is this, what we call the Scopes Trial. Um, now, the Scopes Trial itself, uh, at, at least in the beginnings, didn't look like it was going to be much, and then it pretty quickly swelled into a huge event, a cultural event. So it goes way beyond just our study of what was going on in the churches as far as theology to actually American culture. And like I said, it's how we got to where we are today. This whole matter of the Scopes trial. It's kind of like uh, when we study the Reformation, we talked about Martin Luther. You know, the big event there is him nailing the 95 theses to the Wittenberg church door. Or perhaps it's whenever he stood before uh, the Diet of Worms and he said, here I stand, I can do no other. You know, those are sort of the pivotal moments. Well, this is one of those pivotal moments. And we're going to see tonight that it's actually not one that is that we celebrate. It's, in other words, there's not a lot of good that comes out of the Scopes trial, quite frankly. Um, it turns into really a negative as far as our nation is concerned, and I think for the most part. Uh, now, there are interesting ripples that come out from the Scopes trial. And it's oftentimes called the Scopes monkey trial. Um, that term, monkey trial, was coined during the event... And uh, it actually is a pretty good description, the monkey trial, because it turned into sort of a circus. Uh, in fact, it kind of started off as a circus in some ways. So there's a lot to cover tonight, and I want to try and be reasonable as far as time. So let's dive right into the monkey trial. Uh, so number one is the backdrop for the trial itself. Let's get a little background, a little history, a little context and it begins, letter A, the controversy surrounding evolution. So this, this trial happens in 1925, right in the middle of the 1920s, which is the era of greatest conflict for the uh, scopes, or for the um, whole battle with modernism within the churches. So a lot of denominations are embroiled at this time, deep, knee deep, in these discussions and controversies. Um, fundamentalists are waging war in their denominations against modernism, which would include this matter of evolution. So letter A is the controversy surrounding evolution. Evolution's been around for, oh, about half a century or more. Charles Darwin first published The Origin of Species in 1859. And in the years from 1859 to 1925, evolution has spread like wildfire. Most of the universities are now teaching evolution. Most of the uh, schools are promoting it, and it's it's becoming more and more mainstream. Now, that's not it's not where it is today yet, but it's gaining steam, and evolution is becoming a very popular topic. It's also being a very controversial topic. Fundamentalist preachers, in particular, are speaking out loudly against evolution, saying that this is anti-God, it's anti-civilization, it's anti-American, um, it's despicable, and it's going, they're going to be the undoing of our country. So down with evolution, um, it's all a bunch of lies. Meanwhile, the sort of the uninterested middle, so you've got scientists and stuff on one side who are promoting evolution, on the other side you have the fundamentalists who are decrying evolution, and in the middle is sort of just everybody else who doesn't really care too much about it. And many of them are starting to drift towards evolution just because that's what they're being taught, you know. And unless, unless they feel strongly against it, they're going to just sort of go with the drift. So evolution is gaining momentum, but it's also stirring up a lot of controversy. A lot of the uh, fundamentalist leaders at this time uh, are very vocal against evolution. They're against modernism. They're against... Um, when I say against modernism, I mean the the attempt to try to meld the Bible with modern thought. They're not against modern technology. They're not against any of that kind of stuff. They're against this corruption of the Bible, um, which would include the theory of evolution. But what really sparks the um, the Scopes trial itself 
is uh, letter B, the anti-evolution law, or you could put Tennessee anti-evolution law. Because it's particularly in Tennessee, so you can just use an abbreviation, you know, like TN for Tennessee. I didn't give you a lot of space there. Well, a number of these fundamentalist leaders were appealing to the states, to state governments, to pass laws outlawing the teaching of evolution. You know, if this was such a criminal doctrine, if it has so many bad ramifications, then we need to get rid of it. We need to ban it from being taught. It wasn't taken seriously in a lot of places, but in Tennessee, they did pass a law against the teaching of evolution. Now, what? why at this point in history? Well, one example and one person we're going to look at particularly tonight, William Jennings Bryant, he was on the war path against evolution. And the thing that really tipped the scales for Bryant, apparently, is post-World War I. So World War I, still fresh in everybody's memory, it just ended a few years ago. And a lot of people were connecting German nationalism and the German philosophy to evolution. In other words, the, the Germans were marching forward uh, kind of with an evolutionary mindset, and it had created this mass bloodshed. And so William James Bryan says, this is where evolution leads. Which, in a way, he's more right than we know, right? Because Adolf Hitler comes along with these same ideas of a master race and, you know, destroying the weaker to make way for the super, the super race. Uh, so, he's not, he's not entirely wrong. The, the truth is, a lot of evolutionists don't take it that far, which we can be glad for, right? I'm glad that not every evolutionist doesn't take it as far as it could go because the world will be horrible to live in. It's already bad enough. We don't need it worse. Uh, so Brian, in post-World War I, is, is railing against evolution. And one of his big critiques is it's, it'll destroy our civilization. It's not good. It doesn't promote, promote good morals. If we're all just animals, highly evolved animals, we're not, we're not a special creation of God, then, hey, I mean, what, what makes anything wrong? And it eventually it's going to disintegrate morals in America. So they passed this law in Tennessee banning the teaching of evolution. So here's the wording of the actual law. It said this. It shall be unlawful for any teacher in any of the universities, normals, and other public schools of the state, which are supported in whole or in part by public school funds to the state, to teach any theory that denies the story of divine creation of man as taught in the Bible, and to teach instead that man has descended from lower order of animals. This was called the Butler Act. So in other words, you can't teach anything that denies the story of creation in the Bible, and you can't teach that man uh, descended from some other animal. Okay? Now, obviously, there's going to be people unhappy about this, right? Uh, people are just waiting to jump all over this. And that's exactly what happens in the Scopes trial. Now the question becomes, why Dayton, Tennessee? Because that's where this whole battle unfolds. The whole trial happens in this really remote, I mean, Dayton is a tiny little town of 1,800 people. I mean, it's just a blip on the map. It's in Ray County in Tennessee. Why on earth would Dayton, Tennessee of all places become the center of attention for the entire world for the space of a week? Or at least America, for the space of a week. Well, the question is, let us see, why Dayton? Why Dayton? Interesting, there was actually a booklet that was published uh, called Why Dayton of All Places. And they published it for the Scopes trial, and they were out selling copies of it in the streets. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a moment. So why Dayton? Well, number one is the ACLU offer. So you guys know the ACLU, right? The American Civil Liberties Union. Today, they're known for promoting all kinds of leftward agenda. Um, you know, but it, so American Civil Liberties Union, they, they had a whole team of lawyers to fight for causes that they thought were just. They were actually started, as I understand it, during World War I uh, to defend conscientious objectors, people who didn't want to go to war, and they were helping them get out of being drafted, basically. Um, 
But right in the start, the ACLU had sort of this leftward trend. So they heard about this Tennessee law, and they didn't like it at all. So all these New York ACLU lawyers sent out an offer, and they published it in newspapers all over Tennessee, basically saying, if anybody wants to challenge this law, we will pay for your legal fees, we will provide you lawyers, and we will fight for you if you want to challenge this law. Now, what it meant was you had to come out openly and say, hey, I have, vi I have taught evolution. So what happens is down in Dayton, Tennessee, there's a guy named George Rappelier. Um, you don't need to write that down. But he's, he owns a mine near Dayton, Tennessee. And he reads this in the newspaper and says, whew, what a great way to put Dayton on the map. You know, this would really draw commerce to our little town. So he goes over to Robinson's drugstore. Him and a couple of buddies, Robinson and a few other people, sit around and they talk. And they say, listen, if we got somebody in this town to, to take this up, we could really make bank on this thing. You know, we could really um, make the most of this opportunity. And that's number two there. It's the unique opportunity or just the opportunity. So George Rappelier and these other guys saw this as, hmm, we could really turn this into something. So they decided to go hunt down somebody to challenge the law because you know he was a miner. Robinson owned the drugstore. They weren't exactly teachers. Well, they had a biology teacher in town who had interestingly taught evolution, but you know he was a, a professor. He was a teacher at the school, and he had a lot to lose if he you know lost his job. So instead, they go to a guy named John T. Scopes, and that's a uh, letter D. Who was John Scopes? Who was John Scopes? Well, the answer is um, he was a 25-year-old single guy living in Dayton. Um, he was coaching ba basketball, baseball, football, and a couple other things. He was also a substitute teacher. He substitute taught biology for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and so they come to this John Scopes and they say, listen, um, do you want to, if you'll let us, we'll, here's the offer, you know, here's what we can do. And so John Scopes, apparently, the, the story is he was playing tennis and the guys all came over and, and said, hey, do you want to be the center of this case? And he said, yeah, sure, and went back to playing tennis. Um, so it seemed like he didn't take it all that seriously. In fact, John Scopes, it seems like his main interest was basically just chasing girls around Dayton, Tennessee. Um he didn't really have any skin. In the, I mean, he didn't care about evolution. He didn't care about really anything related to the trial. So John Scopes was basically nobody as far as, uh, you know, he didn't have a reputation. He didn't really have much to lose either. I mean, he had only been teaching, or should I say coaching, at the school for a year. And so, you know, after all this, he ended up just moving on somewhere else. Uh, but, of course, sadly for John Scopes, he could, his name was forever embodied in the case so everywhere he went he was always John T. Scopes of the Scopes trial you know so kind of branded in that way all right so that that's the backdrop Scopes agrees they call the ACLU and say hey we've got your t a test case here um, so Scopes confesses or instead I think somebody reports him as having taught evolution he's arrested which is you know it was a formality really more than anything and somebody, of course, paid his fine. I think it was. It may have been the ACLU. Um, or paid his bail, I mean. But that kicks off the trial. Now, it starts off, you know, nothing too impressive. Just, you know, okay, there's going to be a case about evolution. But pretty soon, um, people start to realize this could be a big deal. This could be a very big deal. And a lot of popularity and stuff gets attached to it. So let's talk, number two, about the participants in the trial. The participants. Because this is where it starts to heat up. It goes from being a little case in a small town in Tennessee to being a national story. Um, so let's look at the characters and then we'll kind of explain who they are and how they got here. Uh, so letter A is the prosecution. So technically the, the case is the state of Tennessee versus John T. Scopes. So representing the state of Tennessee, which is upholding anti-evolution law, the Butler Act, um, initially, uh, 
it's actually the Hicks brothers, but we'll start with uh, number one, Tom Stewart. Stewart is really the only, the only guy who comes through this uh, mostly unscathed. Um, he actually does a pretty good job. And he's representing the state of Tennessee, basically saying, okay, Scopes, you broke, you knew what the law was, you broke it, and now you got to pay. That was, his, that was his whole take. He, he was kind of opposed, that Tom Stewart was kind of opposed to making this a big show. Let's just have a, a trial, let's do what we got to do, and then let's get out of here. Let's not turn this into a big two-week fiasco. Oh Unfortunately, he didn't have much say in it because it blew up pretty quick. Initially, though, no, number two is the Hicks brothers. They were the ones who were go originally going to take it, and they were involved all the way through. Um, it was Herbert and Sue Hicks. And they were just small-town lawyers. They were just lawyers there in Dayton. In other words, when this thing got started, they stepped up to do their job, and then uh, – Big names started to form around it. Also, number three, Ben McKenzie was part of the prosecution. But the big name to, to remember here is William Jennings Bryan. Bryan throws his support in here. And that's what really transformed this case. Because William Jennings Bryan was one of the most important politicians, well, one of the most important politicians in American history. He kind of was in his twilight here. But he ran for president of the United States three times, almost won at least one of those times. Um, he was a Democrat, uh, very influential. He served uh, in Congress. Uh, he, in 19, or excuse me, in 1896, he had preached, a, or preached, <laughs> gave a, a famous speech at the Democratic National Convention um, on the Cross of Gold, where he was arguing uh, for the silver standard. For currency uh, but that speech catapulted him into national acclaim he actually got the democratic nomination over incumbent grover cleveland so he actually ousted grover cleveland and became the democratic nominee now he didn't become president obviously but he ran another two times so in 1896 again in 1900 and then in 1908 he ran for president uh, so he was well known so imagine this for a second if there was a case, let's say here in Johnson County or let's say Brown County, about evolution in the schools. And, you know, at first there's just small town lawyers and then somebody like Dick Cheney, you know, shows up. He's never been president, but he's been in politics. Or somebody like a, and I know they're gone now, but like Bob Dole or John McCain, you know. They were never president, but they were politicians that all of us would know. Imagine one of those people showed up in Brown County and said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prosecute this case. Uh, you can better believe that Fox News is going to notice, you know, it's, it's a big deal. And so Brian has been on the warpath against evolution for a while now. So this is his sort of his project. Uh, Brian had been a, he was a marvelous speaker. Uh, it was said that Brian, no matter what the issue, he could get people behind him no matter what issue it was because he was just that compelling. Um, and so he would go around, and his whole thing, he, he was sort of retired from politics now, uh, had gotten into real estate in Florida, and was back when that was sort of getting going. So he was on the ground floor of real estate in Florida. And, but his big activity was speaking. He would travel around, and he would speak on different subjects, and drew big crowds. And his most recent emphasis had been teaching against evolution and, and preaching against it. Um... He was a Presbyterian. Um, interestingly, he was liberal in his politics, but he was conservative socially. Um, so he was, you know, in favor of uh, unions and uh, was against World War I. In fact, he had served as the Secretary of State under Woodrow Wilson and resigned over the whole uh, World War I, getting involved. Uh, so he actually was fairly liberal for his time politically, but socially he was conservative. He was a, a devout uh, Presbyterian. So as soon as William Jennings Bryan signs up, it just, the whole trial becomes, you know, flashing lights. You know, all the newspapers in America are printing, you know, Scopes trial is lining up. Now this is the spring of 1925, when all this is getting set up. The trial will happen in July. So the prosecution, state of Tennessee, we've got those guys. Um, 
The main one to note, in fact, if you want to just circle it, William Jennings Bryan, he's going to be the main character we're going to follow. On the defense side, letter B, so the defense of John T. Scopes, you have Arthur Garfield Hayes, named after several presidents. Um, Dudley Field Malone was a New York attorney, a divorce attorney, actually. Um, ran for governor of the state of New York, uh, lost. But he was a very sharp lawyer. He was very quick-witted, very good with words. You know, the, the things lawyers are good at. But number three was the big one. So if you want to circle one from this list, Clarence Darrow. He was a huge name. Very controversial. In fact, the ACLU did not want Darrow on the case because he just created too much bad publicity. Darrow had a reputation of defending really bad criminals and getting them either off the hook or light sentences. Um, and he, he was an agnostic, but he really was outspoken in his dislike for Christianity. Um, the year prior, 1924, he had defended two young men, Leopold and Loeb, in a famous case. These two young men, they were both college graduates, um, real sharp intellectually, but they were basically, they would probably today be uh, diagnosed as sociopaths. So they both, um, these two guys got together, they kidnapped one of their 14-year-old cousins and murdered him with a pickaxe or with an um, ice pick or something. And basically the reason they gave, I mean, they, they admitted that they did it. Um, and they basically said, we did it for the thrill of it type of thing. So evil to the core. Well, Darrow comes along and defends these guys and basically says um, it was psychologically determined. You know, In other words, it wasn't their fault. It was all these psychological factors, you know, the way they were raised and, you know, the things that they were, because they were both well-to-do, you know, from wealthy families and stuff. And so that stunted their knowledge of right and wrong. And so, so basically they weren't really responsible. And they ended up getting life in prison instead of the death sentence in Illinois. Um, so Darrow, and a lot of people, you know, felt like miscarriage of justice. These guys should have gotten the death penalty. Darrow is, was not America's favorite lawyer at the time. Uh, but he was, he was a real tough, as, tough guy, you know, um, gritty, uh, mean-spirited. <laughs> uh, so Darrow... As soon as he hears that William Jennings Bryan is going to be on the prosecution, he says, sign me up. Uh -huh. And he and basically, he comes, he grabs Dudley Malone, and the two of them go down together. And so now we have this cast of characters all lined up. Actually, a few more. So other people to know about, other players. Let's let her see. Other players. Just a couple to mention. Number one is Judge John Ralston, the judge presiding over the case. Uh, he was actually a lay Methodist preacher. <laughs> so that will, that will come later on. Uh, and then number two is journalist H.L. Minken. So Minken was a very popular uh, journalist uh, for the Baltimore Sun. And he, he was also an agnostic, a uh, real critic of Christianity, but he was also a very witty uh, writer. And so his, his journalistic account of the Scopes trial became, he's the one that coined the monkey trial. And that's, he coined a lot of, uh, th in fact, he coined the term Bible Belt. Uh, and his, his reporting on this is sort of the, uh, well, people look to it as a real achievement in journalism. Um, but it's as much known for its sarcasm as for anything else. Uh, he was not kind to William Jennings Bryan or to Dayton, Tennessee, for that matter. The people who, Rappelier and the other ones who set this thing up, were mad at Minkin because he made Dayton look like a bunch of idiots. All right, so that gets us into the trial itself. So number three is the events of the trial. What happened? Well, I've already mentioned that the trial quickly blew into just this carnival atmosphere. The participants, so the prosecution and the um, defense begin to arrive in town. Um, so they get their, um, kind of get their accommodations, get everything settled, and the trial starts on July 10th. So you see the dates there for the, the trial, July 10th through 21st of, of 1925. So let's go through, I'm gonna talk us through the events of the trial. So the first day is a Friday. 
And basically all they do is select the jury. Um, so they go through and they're, they're trying to pick out a jury, you know, you know, the whole process they have to go through and try and pick su supposedly unbiased people. Yeah, yeah. The, the jury that they eventually came up with, I think 11 of the 13 jurors said that the only book they had ever read in their life was the Bible. And one of them said that he couldn't read at all. So um, you, the prosecutor or the defense was probably thinking we've got a, an uphill battle here because, you know, Dayton, Tennessee is just a rural place. And so the, the forces were on the side of the Bible, not for evolution. However, people like H.L. Mencken and all the journalists who had converged, and there was over 200 journalists who came for this event. Um, you know, they were writing back to uh, New York and Los Angeles and Chicago, and basically their opinion was, you know, we're in this little hick town, we're all these ignorant Southerners, um, and so it really did not do anything good for the commerce and, you know, for Dayton. So Friday, select the jury. Saturday, Brian is out making speeches. The uh, defense team is, is, you know, planning their course of attack and all that. Uh, Sunday, William Jennings Bryan actually preaches at the Methodist church where the judge is the normal preacher, you know. So the judge is on the front seat, you know, applauding everything Bryan says. Monday, they come back. So Monday, July 13th. And the, the trial starts off with a, a movement to quash the uh, charge, uh, which as I understand, I'm not an expert in you know, uh, tri uh, court trials, but I guess what it means to quash is that um, there's they're saying the court the case should be thrown out because it's uncon like the law itself is unconstitutional. We can't you can't prosecute on this law because it's not constitutional. Um, so that that's basically all that happens. Um, you know, Darrow throws some slander the way of the prosecution but nothing else really happens on on monday tuesday july 14th uh judge ralston comes out and um basically says we're not going to quash the case we're not going to we're going to go forward with the um uh, with the whole uh, trial um however oh so letter b is jury selection we already talked about that letter c is controversy over prayer so each day of this trial, they started off with prayer, which was a common practice, nothing unusual. But the, um, the preachers who were praying before each of the things were using their prayers to deliberately attack the defense team. So they were praying, you know, against evolution and against unbelief in our country and stuff. And so Darrow and the other uh, defense attorneys felt, you know, uh, targeted by the prayers and so they were they were a little upset about that so they they complained about it and said you know we shouldn't be doing this with this trial given the subject and all that so they eventually reached a compromise where they would alternate a fundamentalist preacher would would pray and then a modernist preacher would pray so i guess that's how they worked it out um so that's about all they accomplished on tuesday uh bear in mind this is july in tennessee um it's hot, 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 um, up in the 90s, and maybe even in the 100s, who knows. But it was hot, very hot, and there's over a 1,000 people trying to cram into this um, uh, courtroom. And, you know, they're standing outside the windows and, you know, trying to get a view of it, and it's just stifling. Um, so just keep that in mind. So Wednesday starts, and Wednesday is really the beginning of the trial. So Wednesday, July 15th. Stewart, Tom Stewart, of the prosecution starts, and he begins his case with two sentences. Basically he says, here's the law we have in Tennessee, Mr. Scopes broke it, that's all we need to know. <laughs> um, and they, have, they do present some witnesses. They present um, a couple of students who basically come in and say, yes, he taught evolution. Um, and then the, the school superintendent, I think, comes in and says, yes, okay, he did, he did do this. And that's about all there is to the prosecution. He did it. 
Here's the law. He broke it. I mean, it's as simple as that. And that's what Stuart wanted to keep it at. He wanted to make it just that simple. He didn't want it to turn into a circus. Because in Darrow's mind and in Jennings Bryan, both of them are thinking this is a showdown between science and the Bible, between belief and unbelief. And Stuart's like, no, we just need to make this about solving this case and moving on. You know, we can debate the law later, but let's not do it here. Well, Stuart doesn't give you what he wants. Uh, because the prosec or excuse me, the um, defense comes up and basically says, well, what does the law say? And they actually make a good point here. Because these, remember, these are smart lawyers. They're not just dummies. They say, well, what does the law say? It says, um, you're not supposed to teach anything that denies the story of creation as taught in the Bible. But what does the Bible teach? I mean, aren't there so many different interpretations and opinions? And I mean, it can't just be, I mean, which, which interpretation of the Bible do we have to follow? Because they could certainly find some modernists, right? Some supposedly Christians who would be plenty willing to teach evolution. So it was actually a really genius move on their part. Um, we're going to make it about, well, if, we, if, we, if our teaching in Tennessee has to follow the biblical story, well, which biblical story, and uh, do we have to take it all literally, or you know, can we take it figuratively, all that kind of stuff. So they call in this guy um, as a witness, Maynard Metcalf. He was a, a zoology professor, and basically he goes on and talks about um, how evolution is an established fact. Um, and so the prosecution uh, are not happy about this, and so they, uh, what do they always do in the movies when they, uh, they object? There you go. Oh, yeah. object. <laughs> we object. Um, so they object to this saying, you've called an expert witness, Maynard Metcalf, but why, why did you call an expert witness? The only time you need an expert witness in a trial like this is when there's something that the, the jury can't understand. And the prosecution said, we all know what evolution is. We don't, have, you know, we don't need an expert witness to come in and explain it to us. Uh, and so the, the defense objects. But they say, well, if we can't bring our expert witnesses, then we can't present our case. Um, so that basically ends Wednesday. Um, the, the judge waits till the next day on Thursday to decide what he's going to do about expert witnesses. July 16th, Thursday things blow up um basically as the day gets going there's there's discussion back and forth between both sides william jennings bryan gets up and gives an hour-long speech about how evolution is destroying america and how it should be done away with um the uh, on the defense side uh dudley malone gets up and gives another hour-long speech basically about uh, the freedom of the mind and how we shouldn't be enslaved to these uh, you know, primitive stories from the Bible and so on. So the funny thing is, uh, Brian goes on for an hour and everybody stands up and applauds and goes crazy and he finishes. Then Malone gets up, says the exact opposite thing. Everybody stands up and applauds and goes crazy and he finishes. It's like, okay. yeah, apparently uh, they just wanted to hear a good speech. I don't know. Um, or they're easily swayed. I'm not sure. Uh, but it turns into uh, kind of this back and forth, uh, back and forth battle. Tom Stewart at one point, you know, there it's. He basically says, "Listen, if um, even if science, he said, if evolution really is harmful, then we shouldn't teach it, even if it is true." Which that didn't really help their case, but um, so. Thursday of the trial is just sort of back and forth battle. They're going, they're going at each other. Uh, Friday comes along and, and Judge Ralston rules that the defense will not be allowed to present expert testimony on evolution um, or their so-called biblical. Because they also had like modernist preachers that were going to come in and talk about how Genesis really wasn't history and so on. Um, so basically, the judge says, no, we won't hear any expert testimony. And that gets Darrow. You know, Darrow is a snarky guy anyways. Um, he gets all upset, and uh, they, go, they go back and forth. At one point, uh, oh, no, th let me cover it a little more carefully, because it wasn't just a shooting down. The, the defense said, hey, we want to be able to have expert witnesses. And the judge initially said yes, 
But then Brian, Brian interjected and said, if you guys have expert witnesses, I want to be able to cross-examine them. And they did not want that. Because if, if Brian cross-examined them, he would show that they were not really following the Bible, that they're not even true Christians. Um, so it would, have, it would have hurt them a lot. So they said, no, no, we can't do that. No cross-examination. So that's when Ralston said, no, you know, we, if, if you want to have your witnesses, we have to be able to cross-examine. That's how you get at the truth. And then uh, Darrow basically said, when, is this, when has this case ever been about getting to the truth anyways? Uh, and so the, the, the judge said, I hold you in contempt of court and slapped him with a big fine. And that's uh, uh, letters D and E. I kind of skipped through these pretty quick. So letter D is speeches on Thursday. So these big speeches from Brian and Malone. And then letter E is Darrow in contempt of court on Friday. All right, all that leads to the weekend. That weekend, it's sort of the same thing. Um, Brian is, is out speaking. The big thing that Brian is working on uh, is his final statement, his conclusion to the whole trial. He's written out a 15,000 word, um, just epic conclusion to the uh, trial. So in, in his final statements, he's going to give this basically lay it before the American people, you know, that uh, evolution is this harmful, terrible thing. Meanwhile, Darrow and his team are scheming over the weekend, and Darrow actually tells another person in Dayton, I'm, what I'm going to do to, uh, whenever the next week starts is I'm going to call forward the best Bible witness I can to the stand. And, uh, well, Monday rolls around, so July 20th. They decide to move outdoors today on Monday because too many people, they were actually afraid the floor was going to collapse on the um, <laughs> courthouse. They built like a grandstand outside. And so they moved the, the hearing outdoors to the grandstand. Well, out on the grandstand, Darrow gets up and says, I want to call William Jennings Bryan to the stand to testify. And Tom Stewart says, no, absolutely not. Do not do it. To which Bryan responds, I came down here to defend the revealed truth of the Bible and against these agnostics and atheists, and uh, I'm not going to back down now. So Brian takes the stand, and things just get unhinged really fast. Uh, Brian gets up there, and and, and basically Darrow had con concocted all these questions he wanted to ask him, and and he wasn't really looking for answers. All he was trying to do was make Brian look like an idiot. That was his only goal. So he starts off, you know, well, where did where did Cain get his wife, you know? And, and, and you know, did, did God make the sun stand still? And Brian says, well, if God wants to make the sun stand still, he can make the sun stand still. He goes, do you know what would happen if the sun stood still? Or if the earth stood still, you know? Um, and Brian says, well, no. And he says, well, it would dissolve into a, you know, ball of magma and, you know, superheated metal and so on. Um... And so he systematically goes through and like picks picks out these little individual stories. He doesn't let Brian kind of get off. Where he he knows Brian is good, if he gets off onto talking about how awful evolution is. So he stays away from evolution. All he picks out these individual Bible stories, and he lets Brian say enough to sound foolish, at least in the eyes of you know, because he even the way he asks the questions makes Brian look ridiculous. Um, so, yeah, he asks questions like that. He asks questions about Adam and Eve. He asks about uh, the inspiration of the Bible. You know, always sort of with a snarky, you know, cutting Brian off type of approach. I, I had a, a transcript at one point I was going to bring, but you get the idea. Sort of these typical snarky atheist talking points, you know. Um, so the whole time... Stewart is like, come on, get down. Like, this has gone too far. And even eventually, Judge Ralston puts the gavel down and says, no, this has gone too far. Let's just, this has got to be over. Um, so the effect is, it made it made Darrow uh, kind of the, the probing, you know, smart uh, attorney. And it made Brian look like he was, he hadn't thought through the issues and didn't know what he was talking about, and etc., uh, so the next day, on Tuesday, was actually the end of the trial. Um, 
The judge comes back and says, I'm going to strike that whole conversation we had yesterday with Darrow and Brian. That's going to, we're going to strike that from the record. Uh, that, that shouldn't even been in the trial. There was no, there was no point to any of that. Um, and then they find John Scopes guilty and he's slapped with a hundred dollar fine and the trial is over. <laughs> um, now it all seems kind of like what in the world, you know, what a mess. Uh, but the moment when when Darrow called Brian to the stand was one of the most, probably one of the most historically significant moments of the 1920s, at least. Um, because it changed the direction that uh, America was going. So letter F, I, I keep skipping over these before I give you the, the terms. Letter F is Brian on the stand. So this was a huge turning point. Um, and that's number four. Uh, the legacy of the Scopes trial. The legacy of the Scopes trial. What what did this cause? What happened kind of in the aftermath of, of the Scopes trial? Well, first of all, uh, five days after the trial ended, William Jennings Bryan came back to Dayton five days later, preached in the Methodist church that Sunday morning, went home and took a nap and died in his sleep. Seriously. Yeah. Wow. So this was literally the last thing he did in his life, pretty much. Um, and the whole thing was a stir. Some people, you know, at that time, people were claiming, well, he died of a broken heart because he just, you know, was so devastated by this. Um, other people were saying, basically, Darrow put him in his grave. Um, and so there was a lot of kind of back and forth banter about that. Well, letter A, here's the legacy. It framed the conflict between religion and science. Now, that's not to say that it begun that. Long before the Scopes trial, people have been trying to pit religion against science and science against religion. You know, the two don't match. You know, the, the Bible uh, doesn't give us an accurate picture of science, etc. But in the popular mindset, at least in America, that the idea that Christianity and science were too vastly different fields, you know, and that the Bible was just myth and science is real fact. I mean, that was certainly around, but after the Scopes trial, that's really, it, it was, the Scopes trial kind of put it into perspective of, you can be a dumb Christian and believe all this Bible stuff, or you can be a smart science person over here. And those are your choices. Um, and that's, and that, like I said, that's the legacy we live with now. In the 1600s, 1700s, nobody would have really thought Christianity and I mean, some people might have, but the thought that Christianity and science were incompatible. Just, I mean, Isaac Newton was a, you know, perhaps unorthodox in some ways, but he affirmed a lot of supernaturalism and, and the Bible and so on. Um, they didn't see a problem with following the, the evidence of science and being a Christian. You know. But post-Scopes trial, that line was drawn even more clearly, at least in a lot of people's minds. You had the choice between religion and science, and, and one is sort of the path of ignorance and uh, you know, faith, whereas the other is fact and, and objective. So it, it kind of, it didn't create that bifurcation, but it certainly... Made it certainly set those two in relief against one another. Uh, number two, it changed attitudes toward fundamentalism, and I know I didn't give you a lot of space for that, but did, it changed the attitude of Americans, a lot of them, towards fundamentalism. So before 1925, a lot of Americans would have sided with uh, William Bell Riley and William Jennings Bryan and um, you know Jay Gresham Machen and some of those. Fundamentalists. In other words, it was it was still kind of cool to be a fundamentalist, I guess, before 1925. Whereas after the Scopes trial, that's where fundamentalists kind of got the reputation, if you will. Uh, a lot of times people's stereotype in their mind of what is a fundamentalist, they think, oh, Southern, uneducated, uh, you know, just ignorant, Bible-thumping kind of thing. Well... That caricature is basically what H.L. Mencken said of Dayton, Tennessee. You know, these people are just a bunch of Bible thumpers and ignorant rednecks, you know. Uh, and so that really 
Because if you think about it, in the 1920s, who who was the main voice or one of the main voices for um, fundamentalism? J. Gresson Machen, who you know had studied at Princeton Seminary and had traveled to Europe to get his doctorate degree. Uh, you know, not an ignoramus. You know, not some backwoods country hick. Uh, he was a highly cultured, you know, New Englander, and yet fundamentalism got the reputation for sort of all oh, uneducated, you know, out in the woods type of people, and that was basically from the Scopes trial onward. Um, so number one, fundamentalists were portrayed as simple, ignorant people. The other changed attitude was that progressives were open-minded and on the side of freedom. Uh, so William Jennings Bryan and the prosecution won the case. They convicted Scopes and he was found guilty of, of violating the law. But Darrow and the defense won the war. Because they they shifted attitudes in America towards evolution. Other states were considering similar laws against evolution. And they, of course, after the Scopes trial, didn't even think about it. Because they didn't want to go through that fiasco. Um, here's the funny thing, though. Here we are almost 100 years after the Scopes trial. And what is it that's anathema in the public school? If you if you dared to teach a biblical view of you know my goodness you know you'd get kicked out of school so fast you wouldn't even know what hit you. So it's funny you know that here basically back in 1925 they were you know the school was teaching you know you can't teach anything but Christianity and they're saying look we've got to be open we've got to consider other options you know we can't just be so narrow minded and you know we've got to be able to teach I mean it, it isn't education about the freedom of the mind. You know, that we should be able to entertain different ideas. And it's funny how that's been completely turned around, that uh, freedom only matters when it's what we want. <laughs> and once we get in power, there's no way we're going to let you have your freedom to teach anything other than evolution. So kind of funny. Another legacy which, you know, grows out of this changed attitude toward fundamentalism, uh, the whole Scopes trial was fictionalized in a play in 1955 called Inherit the Wind. Um, it was later made into a movie starring Spencer Tracy as uh, Henry Drummond, who was basically the Clarence Darrow type of character. There's nothing really of truth in the play or in the movie. Basically, the, mo the movie plays out where Christians are dumb and smart, intellectual, you know, free-minded, open-minded people uh, defend the free access to truth. Really, what it ended up being was um, the whole play was meant as sort of a, an allegory to McCarthyism. But the problem is some people's only exposure to the Scopes trial is Inherit the Wind. And so all of their ideas about this, the trial are basically wrong because the plot trial totally skews what, or the play skews what the trial was all about. Um, all right, so a couple of lessons from the Scopes trial, and we could probably point out a number of these. Well, let me give a couple. Number one, have confidence in the Bible, not yourself. I don't know if you noticed this or not, but it seems to me having, you know, I, I read Larson's book on the topic, I've read some other things on the Scopes trial, and it seems to me that William Jennings Bryan was confident in the Bible, which was good. But he also seemed pretty confident in himself to be able to defend it. And when he got his moment on the stand, he ended up not looking very smart. Uh, I'm not saying... I mean, I think it was good for him to defend the Bible. We should have confidence in that. But confidence in yourself. Uh, it's kind of like occasionally people will, will um, label themselves... Uh, like on the radio or on TV or the internet, you know, I'm the Bible answer man. Yeah. It's like, okay, that sounds pretty, I mean, I hope you're not being proud, but it sounds pretty arrogant to say I'm the Bible. If you got a Bible question, give it to me. I, I'm your Bible answer man. Uh, okay, you who know so much, <laughs> you know. 
And I kind of feel like that about Brian a little bit. Like, he, he kind of comes down there with this bombastic, you know, I'm going to defend the Bible against all these heretics, you know, all these uh, modernists. And then he ends up being the one who looks foolish. I don't think he was. And, and you know, sometimes Christians are going to be made to look foolish, even though, we're, even though we stand on the truth. So I'm not blaming him for looking foolish, uh, especially because the hand he was dealt. I mean, Darrow basically just ran circles around him. But don't you think it would have been better if Brian had listened to Stuart and they just sat down? You know, in other words, he hadn't taken the stand. He didn't have to take the stand. Um, but he seems so confident that I'm gonna I'm gonna shut these people down. I'm gonna I'm really going to set the record straight once and for all. So have confidence in the Bible, yes, but don't trust in yourself that, hey, you know, I have the answers. You know, sometimes I can even get in this attitude where you get into a discussion with somebody or talk to somebody and think, I, I, I mean, I study the Bible. I know a lot more than they do. And you may get slammed with a question. You're just like, uh, I, I don't know. Um, so be confident in the Bible, not yourself. Uh, even in those conversations where you, maybe you are asked a question. Don't back down and say, well, you know, okay, the Bible does, I don't know. Uh, you can say, well, I trust in the Bible and it's been proven over and over and over again to me. I don't know the answer to this particular question, but it doesn't shake my confidence in the word. Uh, number two, you can't legislate a biblical worldview. And that kind of what they were doing, like we're going to pass a law and that's going to fix it. Like we're going to pass a law saying you can't teach evolution and that will sort of take care of the problem. Now, I think there's a place for, for good laws, but it seems like fundamentalists during the 1920s worked hard to pass laws, and almost all those laws no longer exist anymore. So how, how much good did they really do? Uh, a good example, besides this anti-evolution, you know, what was the other thing that people were, not just Christians, but a number of Americans were concerned about? Oops. Alcohol, yeah. And so they actually got a amendment to the U.S. Constitution passed prohibiting the sale of alcohol. And you had the prohibition. And it seemed like that was a major victory for, you know, the Christian worldview and all, you know, Billy Sunday and all these people who were preaching against alcohol. Um, and what happened? Ten years later, the amendment was repealed. Um they worked real hard to get this anti-evolution ban passed, and next thing you know, it's off the books. Uh, so again, I'm not saying that the, we should never appeal for political, but man, don't don't trust in that. Uh, you can't make people, especially unregenerate people who, are, I mean, what they need is Christ, not a law telling them, you know. Now, if we could pass a law in this country or somehow, you know, vote in such a way as to ban abortion, by all means. I mean, that, we're talking about the wholesale slaughter of children. So I'm all for that. Um, you know, if there's other ways to vote, I'm going to always vote consistent with my biblical worldview. But to think that we can sort of make our country more Christian by passing some more laws or by getting the Ten Commandments put onto the lawn of a courthouse, uh, I think we have an unrealistic view of, of things. And then uh, number three, our views of origins matter, or origins, yeah, or I guess in the plural. Uh, I think this is something that Jennings Bryan and the others got right, and that is evolution has, it's not just sort of this harmless theory, but has implications. And, and what you believe about the beginning of life and the beginning of the universe truly does matter. And unfortunately, we're seeing that today. That we've, America has had a steady diet of evolution, evolutionary worldview for a long time. And so within that, we're seeing sort of the fallout where some lives don't matter as much as others. Ultimately, if you, if you approach life and everything from an evolutionary worldview where, you know, there is no basis for 
for morality, for living under God as accountable to an ultimate judge. You know, that's swept away with evolution. So, so is the idea that man is unique from animals. That's why you can, at one ha hand, have you know murders galore in all of our major cities, and on the other hand, we also have people advocating that you know you can't damage a, an eagle's egg. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying we should go out and destroy eagle's eggs, but I'm just saying we've gotten wildly out of perspective. I think the whole matter of origins matters a great deal. I read actually a little article from Answers in Genesis in which they argued that Jennings Bryan, whenever he was on the stand, um, actually kind of capitulated on on some things. You know, he, he wasn't quite willing to say that the world was created in actual. He basically said, yeah, it was six days, but you know, I, I, I'll leave room for not being actually six days. And so they were making the point that little compromises is what yeah. sort of did him in and, and that Darrow took those little compromises and basically said, well, if you're going to if you're interpret it figuratively here and not literally, well then, why can't we just take the whole thing as figurative? In which case, you don't have a leg to stand on.